to be cool. I don't know if it's going to be that cool. <laughs> Anyways, let's get started. So, name is Eduardo Kastner. I'm the principal strategist for Data Center. Why am I doing desktop? Because I've been doing desktop for 12 years and even bought, though my boss may be here, I don't know. Even though my boss told me two years ago, stop doing desktop, I, I don't listen to him anyway. So why start now, right? So I've been doing this analysis, this study, and this uh, talk with customers for a long, long time. I've been in Microsoft about eight years. My job is rather simple. I talk to good people such as you in customer environments 90% of my time and 10% of my times I go back to the product groups and uh, get them back to reality. Is that cool? So in other words, I was a CIO in my previous life for a whole bunch of years. Uh, I ran operations of EDS in Mexico, so I, I had a whole bunch of experience with uh, GM and airlines and, and uh, American Express, a whole bunch of good environments. So. With that said, uh, I just struck this out with flexible desktop because I'm getting tired of that name, so I'm dumping it, right? This is, I, I call it work style because I don't want to call it devices. Is that fair? But I'm trying to say whatever you want to bring. And it's not a BYOD. I think that's a great acronym, but it doesn't mean anything, just like strategy. And no, I don't know how to stay on the podium, so I will swing around and get all of you at some point. So let's start. Uh, I don't believe in agenda slides, so let's go. This is the question you got to ask yourselves. Let's start with a good one, okay? Let's, let's start with a big smack. Uh, I know this is ridiculous because I've heard it a thousand times, but you know what? Alice in one don't know where you want to go. It really doesn't matter which road you take. Fair? So if I ask you what's your BYOD strategy, and you tell me, well, you know, just let anybody bring whatever they want. Well, guess what? That's not really a strategy. And if you turn around and you say, well, we actually let a couple people bring whatever they wanted, and now we got to manage it. So we are not a BYOD position. We're in an MDM position, right? Mobile device management. Am I screaming enough for you? No. Clearly, some people had a really good meal. I got to get more in your face. OK, let's see if I can get you excited. Then they say, we're going to manage whatever the mess is, right, that we bought or that we let people bring in. So then they go out and they try to find somebody who can imagine what that mess is and build a solution for you. And guess what? There's no magic in the industry. I think most of you know that. People who have my level of receding hairline know that better. <laughs> and by that I mean there is no solution that manages everything under the sun. Mostly when there's some operating systems that you change one line of code, you call it another candy, and then it's out there, right? So it's really hard to do this. And I'm not ranting or raving at anybody specifically. I'm just saying it's really hard to do this. And the third one is, you know what? I have a solution. I'm going to solve everything under the universe. I said the universe word, by the way, with VDI, right? All the problems I've ever had since the 80s, right? I'm still not going to manage my PCs. I'm not going to manage my images. I'm not going to manage my applications. I still will not look at my login scripts that are in place there from 1980s. Is that fair? Who loves Def Leppard? Man, there's a concert. I'm going there tonight. I said 80s. You guys got to understand. So you know what happened? I can't manage that and throw it into a VDI image and promise you I'm going to give you a good, a good VDI experience. But we're going to solve it with VDI. Let me translate that into a different word. I'm going to build a house with a hammer. That's all I need. I just need a hammer. That's what happens when you say VDI. Because we're treating it as the cure-all to old problems. And we're not trying to fix it. So again, when I ask you what is your strategy, I'm looking for you to look really, really well into what you want to achieve. Are you here to make your end user experience better? Are you here to give them more flexibility? Are you here to reduce your cost of operations? You can't say yes to all of those. It doesn't work. So if you say, I want a cheaper, faster, better, and prettier, it's a no, OK? So you're going to have to let go of some, something there. And what I'm trying to say is, if you don't have this goal defined, everything else that I'm going to talk about today doesn't work. So please understand, it's the hardest part, it's the most boring part, and it is the most critical. Now, let this go, and let's start. 
Let's talk about, let's, let's have a little couple more moments of sarcasm and cynicism. Why not? It just, it's entertaining at least, right? So let's see what's happening today. I hope, I hope you agree with me on a couple of these things. I like to put all my research and all my, my sources on the bottom. So if you want to check my sources, you go ahead. I'm more than happy. But you see, what happens is we did two studies. The first study said uh, we asked 100, about 100 IT organizations, uh, and this is we asked IT. What percentage of your users access high business impact data? You know what high business impact data means? It means data that is compliancy related, OK? On a personal device. And, and about 34%, they said. You know, IT said, well, it's about 34%. And then we asked the users of the same organization, and they said, well, it's actually closer to 70. And I just have a question for you, and the question is, who do you think is right? There's only one guy smiling there, OK? So, so he must be right because the other guy's pretty mad. So I want you to understand that even if that study was not right, we found that through another study that, and this is Gardner, that 88% of employees are using their personal technology to access business data today. And that people are carrying about 3.3 devices on average. I don't know what the hell 0.3 means, but <laughs> it's 3.3. I know I carry about four devices. I use two. <laughs> But I carry four. And what's more interesting is I love going on a, fill, on, a, on a plane. I know I'm talking about some of you. I'm super sorry. I'm going to say this in a funny way. I'm not trying to make fun of you, but I am. OK? I love the guy who pulls out his, his iPad or Android, whatever, his slate, right? And he pulls out a bass, and he pulls out a keyboard, and he pulls out a mouse, and he pulls out a pen. And you know, five minutes later, I just feel like walking over and saying, buddy, just buy an Ultrabook, you know? Seriously, <laughs> this is not working for me. I don't know if it's working for you, but you're carrying seven pounds, or for those of us who are in kilos, you're carrying five kilos where you should be carrying one. Okay? But it happened. Now, don't make too much fun, because we've all done it. <laughs> we've all bought the extra A and B and C and try to decompose the laptop and recompose it. And let me say something. The point three device is what's interesting. I'll say why. Look, there's... A couple of things that are happening today. The first thing is we're all semi-dyslexic. And I'm not making medical fun of anybody. I'm trying to state a generic sense. And now let me explain myself. I wake up and I read email. And then I say hi to my wife. Good morning. And then I, then I go and take a shower and do all my things. And then I go and see my children and I see another email. And I go into the car and I use Bluetooth because I like to be safe. And then I, I, I talk to a colleague. And then I get to the office and between meetings, I call a vendor who's going to do I don't know what for my house. And then when is it that I'm not being completely dyslexic in the day? Because there's no more work. Would you agree? There's no more real like work thread line or like before I used to do, I'm not kidding, before as in 15 years ago, I used to go to work and I used to work five hours straight or three hours straight. And I would take a break and do something. Right now I just, I don't know where work and life dissipate to each other. So what I'm trying to say to you is that we're no longer in screens, which is where we think we are. We're at the level of activity. I will do it wherever I can. So if I have to send an email, I'll do it at the kiosk out here, or I'll do it on my phone, or I'll do it on my tablet. I'll do it whatever is more convenient and accessible to me right now, not even necessarily the best technology available. Is that fair? So now you understand, I'm focused on the activity, not even on the screen. And what I want satisfaction on is on the activity. And my satisfaction level is dramatically different in a desktop. In a desktop, I'm willing to wait. Listen to yourselves, OK, if you disagree. I'm willing to wait a couple seconds to get something done. On a cell phone, heck no. If I say dial and you don't dial, <laughs> I hate you, Mr. Phone. It's right there. So my expectation of service on a phone, whether it be on an application, or on a call, or on something critical, is nanoseconds. It's right now. Versus on a, on a PC, or, or on a Mac, or on a whatever, on Android, you know, on, on a desktop, on a laptop, I can wait a little bit. I see the hourglass or whatever, I can wait a little bit. So it's very interesting what's happened to us. But what's more interesting even is that, I'm not going to read all these things for you, but I'm just going to say one thing. Around how many billion people are in the world today? Anybody? Seven billion. 
Did you know that that number out, up there is, by the way, outdated? It's about 6.7 billion devices, right, cell phones, in the market today. And they're saying that by 2000, you choose a number, 14, it's going to be 7.5 billion. So in other words, there's going to be more cell phones than human beings in the world, which makes sense because some of us are carrying two in their pocket. But what I'm trying to say is there's people that don't have what to eat and they still carry a cell phone. So it's become, you know, Maslow theory of needs. <laughs> it's completely messed up. People need a cell phone before they eat now. And so what I'm trying also to tell you is that even though my sarcasm may not be fun for you, your primary device is not a tablet. It's not, bless you, a desktop or a laptop. It's literally a phone. Because that's what everybody has. Everybody. And that's where everybody's trying to meet their first requirements for information. While I will never use a phone or a 10-inch tablet to review an Excel spreadsheet. Now, it's not that Excel will not be in the future accessible and comfortable in those. Today, it isn't. Is that fair? So if you have a EMR, right, medical solution or whatever, choose an application, right, manufacturing application, whatever, ticketing, mainframe screen, I don't care, that the resolution is 1024 by 768. And that's not a big thing. That's, I didn't say big. And you throw it on a terminal services, whatever, remote VDI, choose a remote whatever, into a 10-inch tablet, and I end up having to scroll, I hate it. So everything worked, but you didn't realize that the device was not OK with the application. Is this good? So also understand that it is the end experience that's really driving why people are thinking about this. Because I want to do it, I want to do it fast, and I want it to work. And I don't want to think about it. So OK, I've said a lot of things that you already know. Let me go faster. There's one thing that you have to realize. This is a huge market misconception. I'm sorry for calling it out so harsh, but here goes. Your ability to go buy right now at Best Buy, at Fry's, whatever, you choose a store. Whichever device you have is consumerization. There's a completely different thing, which is IT's capability of managing those devices. Let me say it again. The guy's ability to go buy whatever he wants is consumerization. IT's capability to manage and or service any of those devices is called consumerization of IT. Both of them are dramatically different. Everybody's talking about consumerization. Almost nobody's talking about consumerization of IT. Is that fair? That's the problem right there. We're talking about, oh, you can go buy whatever you want, but nobody's saying, can we manage whatever you buy? Or what can we do with whatever you buy? So here goes my, my sarcasm for the last slide, and then I go into all positive, beautiful, and, and, and just sunshine and, and, and flowers, OK? Not true, but here goes. It, that's called magician misconception. We're in Vegas. You know, I got to pull some tricks on you. So what happens today is you start with a desktop, a laptop, right? We all started with one device, so you have one configuration, one, one logical configuration, one physical, one local, local applications, browser, data, whatever. And then guess what? Somebody came up to you and they said, we got to reduce the cost of this. It's too expensive. So you say, OK, so we're going to stop the refresh, right? So then some executives started walking in with some, with some iPads, right? And so you said, OK, we've got to manage this thing because it's executive, it's iPads, and, and so let's go buy an MDM solution. Is that fair? I actually build every one of these slides, so I know them by heart. Don't get freaked out if I don't look at them. OK. <laughs> so then what happens is I say, no, 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 but now we're three years later. Things are old. They feel bad. I don't like them. Would you upgrade some of them? So you get some budget and you upgrade some of them. But then after you upgrade them, somebody else comes in and says, why don't we do some BYOD? And what's the cure to BYOD? Bring your own device. Let's drink some good VDI, right? So then you VDI the, the heck out of this. And then, then you end up with 4x. <laughs> you see 4x devices, 4x configurations, 4x everything. Is that fair? Now, were you doing a really good job? Don't tell me. That this poker face, OK? This is where you practice poker face. Don't, don't move, OK? Were you doing a really good job with 1x? OK. So what happens when I do 4x? Now you see my point? Now you see the situation we're aligning ourselves for? So what's interesting here is once you do that, 
you raised the TCO, you did not necessarily enhance the agility of your, of your users. And even more interesting, I don't know if you really solved the problem that you were looking to solve initially. Let me explain this in a different way. If I give you the worst experience possible for the least price, would you like to be here? If I treat you the worst possible and I charge you the least for it, would you want to be here? That's the strategy of IT so far. Right? Tell me I'm lying. Come on, please. Tell me I'm lying. Tell me you're charging people a ton of money and giving them a first-class experience. I don't know why. I won't believe you. At least not today. I, I could have believed you in 1992. Today it's hard because we've been after what? How many cuts, right? How many cuts after we've, we've survived this? So right now the focus is let's reduce the cost. But what went out the window was agility. What went out the window is people being able to do their job with the environments that we were providing to them. So they went to Best Buy. They bought whatever they wanted or thought would help them. They brought into the environment. And half of them were successful. I don't know if you, you agree with this, but half of them were successful. Half of them said, yeah, you know, I got a lot of power out of this. So then they said, IT, I don't know why you shouldn't be supporting me. Because I am getting what I want, not out of you, but I am satisfying my needs with what I buy. So that's the problem, because we end up with 4x. Now, how about if we would say, how about if we cap TCO? What do I mean by cap TCO? Instead of you saying, I'm going to be cheaper every year, you just say, this is the minimum cost of operations to give you the standard of quality we require to run this company. And once you do that, you say, any efficiency that I drive out of this is going to be focused on enhancing the environment, making it better. And therefore, you're going to say, well, this guy's crazy. Yeah, I'm crazy, but not here. And you know what? What I'm talking about specifically is services. Stop thinking about the endpoint device. Let me say this again. Let me say it really hard. Let me say it really loud. Stop thinking about devices. It's the wrong approach. Start thinking about services. Now let me soften up. Okay, so you just say, oh, this guy was screaming at me. Yes, I was, but just for a little bit. Okay, think about synchronization. Think about data protection and compliance. Think about virtualization. Think about identity. Think about classification of data. Think about remote applications. Let me translate this again. Think about the email service. Think about portals. Think about internet. Intranet. You see my point? Think about a business critical application. If you can't replatform that for a screen, then don't. But my point is, think about services, stop thinking about devices. Now, let's keep going. I'm trying to tell you that you can keep one configuration if you, if you end up looking at services versus devices, which is going to be X amount of configurations. Now, I'm trying to say, forget about the desktop strategy or phone or whatever, and think more about a mobile services strategy, OK? It's more about a mobile services, and what am I going to enable on you? Now, with that said, what I want to focus is on literally bringing any service to any device at any time, obviously. Yeah, that was the acronym. But let's look how. You see, I used to do this session, and 80% of the session was why, and 20% was how. And I got tired of it, and this iteration of it, I said, I'm going to do 20% why, which is what we just went through. No more sarcasm now. And now let's do 80% how. OK? Now, by the way, I'm not going to do any demos. So if you're expecting a deeply technical session where I show, no, that's the, all the other sessions. This is the how and why session, OK? So this is more the strategy session. So let's start with all the paradigms. Now, as this are, I don't know if there's 15 or 20 topics here, I cannot go in depth on each one. So I'm going to just give you a taste. I apologize. I wish I had four hours for this session. But as I have one, I can only give you a taste of each one and, and infuse some ideas on you, OK? And then you can just take it on. But you're going to see the, the theme and the topic. If I go too fast, you just, I'm serious, stop me. Let's start with the, new, with the first paradigm. The first paradigm is going from a desktop or one screen to a multi-screen strategy. Now, the way we did it, which is not the way you're going to do it necessarily, right? You could choose another strategy. But the way we did it is we thought about a single graphical interface, which now you know with the one we shouldn't be calling you know what? You know the name, Metro. I said it. Oops, I'm going to go to hell for other reasons. 
Okay? So, but what's interesting about this is we thought, what if I could have a single interface that I can move from one device to the other? Now, why do I think this is very interesting for you? It's not because I'm going to go deeper into this strategy or I think that you should be doing all Microsoft. No. I know you're going to be completely heterogeneous, and I agree with that. But my point is simple. You should understand that if you have 10 critical business applications, those 10 critical business applications, you should come and sit down and realize, should I be having a multiple screen strategy for each one of those? And you're going to say, for seven, yes, and for three, no. Fine. Could be compliancy, could be whatever. But for the seven that you answer yes, you should be thinking, which devices and which formats am I going to enable them this? And this could be screen scraping. This could be throwing them into HTML. It could be rewriting them completely. But if you don't start having this conversation, it's going to come back and bite you later on, right? It's going to come back and eat you because, you know what? In five years, you're not going to have less. So whatever you don't fix now, this is like cleaning the house. Whatever you don't clean now, it's just going to get dirtier tomorrow. It doesn't get better. So you have to have a strategy of how am I going to replatform the screen delivery, the method of consumption of this application. And you should not be doing it for everything. This is not something you can do for every single app. It has to be for your top 10 or your top 5. And that's it. And you go from there. And every single thing that I'm telling you comes from experience of seeing somebody already did it and was successful. Okay, So I'm not just making it up. Now, the idea is to have device-optimized apps, but if you can't do that, think of web apps. And if you can't do that, then think of Terminal, Citrix, RDI, RDS, VDI, etc. But understand, the more, bless you, the more, thing, the more you make this complex and complicated for you, the more it's going to be complex and complicated to manage. It's just we forget that, right? I'm going to build this super simple environment that's going to be laid on VDI, and then, and then with application virtualization, and then I'm going to do a re remote app, and then I'm going to throw it on, on top of IPv6, and then on top of that, I'm going to put a RAS and a VPN, and, and then a unified access gateway. It's going to be beautiful and simple, man. No, it's not. OK? And I love our technology, but you have to understand that the more complex you make it, the more complex it is for you to maintain. And what's the problem with that? Anybody can do it once. Remember that one, OK? If you remember a couple of things in this session, this is one of those. Anybody can do anything once. I bet you, because you know I lost hair in data center, OK? I'll tell you something. I bet you money you are not going to be able to keep with updating that thing three times. And now you see what I'm talking about. Super easy to do it once. Super hard to keep up with technology in five years, because that's two cycles later. And just keeping it the way it is is what got us to this problem, so that doesn't work. So let's keep going. What about services? Now, this is a great example. I didn't have a better way to explain this analogy, so I'm going to say it with an example. But what is this data center to the cloud? And I'm going to do it a little bit different. Uh, Flavors is a very interesting company. They sell tickets to, to events. And what I really liked about this case study, which you can see down there, is that they have multi multiple ways to access the application from the web, from the, the user side. But they burst out. So they have capacity to run a certain amount of ticket purchases, right? And then when that gets overflown, it bursts out into Azure. So what's fascinating here is that this is a multiple strategy, if you notice, is I have a multi-client for format, but I also have a multi-consumption of, of, of a delivery that can burst out into the cloud. So I urge you, read this. And I hope that this idea gives you one form of thinking what data center to the cloud will have an effect on us. And I'm trying to say here, this is on the front end and on the back end. That's why I like this example. Because this example shows you both sides working together towards delivering an experience, which is impressive any way you look at it. I mean, 150,000 tickets in 10 seconds? Come on. That's good for anybody, right? Let me stop with that one right there, because you've heard about data center to the cloud all week, right? So I'm not going to go crazy about that one. Let me go a little bit more into the next one, which is a very, very strong and used one, which is Office to the World, which is what you're doing right now. You see, I used to put out of office notices. I don't even bother, because I don't know when I'm out of office, because I have no idea when I'm in the office. You know, it's just I don't stop reading emails. And I don't think I read emails more frequently when I'm traveling than when I'm in the office. So I, I've, I've gotten used to, and this is not giving you a tip, I've gotten used to not replying as a habit immediately. I always say my minimum reply is going to be half a day. So at least people know that when they send me an email, 
They're going to get half a day response. When they send me an IM, it's going to be instant if I'm available. And when they give me a call, they're going to get me right there or not. But you see, I'm using all my methods. So why am I saying this? Not because I want you to emulate this, because I'm trying to tell you I don't have an out of office anymore. And I don't think many of you do either. I think we put it out of habit, but I don't think you behave differently, which means that you don't have a location anymore. And therefore, if I look at that, you can think of two ways. This is a really, really strong slide. I highly recommend it to you for one reason. Because you can do a who, where, what, or you can do a where, who, what. Let me explain myself. Would you let, let's say you're a bank, OK? And bank is in Europe. So it not only has to be regulated by Sabrina Soxley and, and Jackson and et cetera, it also has to be regulated by Savile, which is 10, 10 times more complicated than Sabrina Soxley, by the way. So would you let the controller of the bank do a large transfer of funds while on an Android tablet? I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just giving an example. If you want me to say iPad, I say iPad. If you want me to say an RT Surface, I'll say that, OK? Understand, I'm being agnostic. While he's on the Grand Cayman Islands. No, why not? You don't evaluate IP and location today, so you wouldn't even know. And you don't evaluate device, so you wouldn't even know how he's accessing. You, don't, you just know it's the, it's the controller making a transfer. You see how bad this is? So my point to you is, I don't care if you ask where, where's the device location, right? Or which device it is, or you ask who, who's first, right? And who is the profile of compliance? Stop thinking of who as the catalog of resources from HR. You're completely wrong. Who is about four profiles only? Corporate employee, highly audited employee, right? So compliant, vendor, and whatever else you want. Maybe manufacturing, kiosk, I don't know. You can get creative with the fourth if you want. But I'm not giving you a fifth. I'll tell you why. Because I don't want to know if the guy is semi-compliant or super compliant. If this gets you in trouble with lawyers and a fine, it's compliant, period. I got to comply with him. You, you see where I'm going? So the interesting thing about this for profile, for user, is I know now that this guy is compliant. I know he's accessing from an IP somewhere in the Caribbean. And I know that he's accessing a high business impact application. Immediate shutdown. You see what I'm saying? I'll give you another example. A branch manager in a bank watching incorrect things on the internet. Wait, there's two things that you should be thinking there. The first thing you thought of is completely wrong. I should enforce policy. No. You're IT. You should report policy. Who enforces policy? HR. We keep forgetting this fact. Why am I saying this? Because I want you to understand that this is the difference between IT enforcing policy and reporting policy. And we forgot about this. So in other words, it is important for you to know where and who. And then finally, is doing what? With these three things, you can do so many powerful things. The whole strategy can be based. I've seen enough. Look, I've done this seven years, eight years. I've, I've helped some of the largest banks in the world and insurance companies and airlines, et cetera. I've worked with a ton of them. I can give you a long, distinguished list. And it was all based on this simple idea, OK, of who, where, what. Or like I said, where, who, what, whatever you, whichever you like. Now, the interesting thing about this is that you can enforce this with existing technologies in many ways. I'm going to give you right now a buffet of technologies, and you choose, right, whichever tickles your fancy, whichever you like better. I don't care. You can do this with direct access. You can do this with IPv6. You can do this with RAS, with VPN. You can do this with DAC. You can do this with Unified Access Gateway. So yes, I can get as technical as you want, but the point is, what are you going to choose is what's interesting. Because depending on what you do, read the title of the slide. I'm not kidding, OK? Whoever just wants to sleep, read the title of the slide. If you want to understand how to do a successful work style strategy, step one, read with me, build an access strategy. If you don't have an access strategy, you don't know what's entering and who's doing what. You have no control. So the only way you're going to be able to know which services you provide is build a strong access strategy. Step number two. Understand that data is not everything that you have. Every time we say data, we, we, we get the heartburn going up, right? We're like, oh my god, everything? No. 
I'll tell you a secret. Here goes. I don't care to secure, to back up, or to do anything to the acceptance of the meeting that I sent to you, that you sent to him, that he sent to me, agreeing whether we go to lunch today or not. And that's 80% of your data, I'm sorry to say. 80% of your data is, I don't even know how to classify it. It doesn't really matter. About, about, well, unfair, 70% of your data is about that, right? I'd say 10% of your data is public info or marketing info, which you don't have to protect because anyways, it's public or marketing, okay? And then about 10% is in between these last two, which is medium or moderate impact, which is email addresses, IP addresses, fax numbers, okay? Anybody, any compliance system, any uh, auditing or compliancy will tell you that this is medium impact. The only thing you have to absolutely secure, and stay with me because this is rather interesting, I did a lot of research just to put this slide together, is if you look at, in the US, Sabarin Soxley, PCI, GLBA, FIMSA, Joint Commissions, HIPAA, in the European Union, Basel Accord 1, 2, or 3, I want you to see this because not everybody understands how much I'm going to go into this. UK, Data Protection Act, FSA, Freedom of Information Act 2000, in Australia, ARPA, in Canada, CSOX, in China, Triple C, in, uh, sorry, Triple C Mark, in Japan, JSOX, and that's just to begin with. So if you tell me your company works in many countries, you have to be compliant if they report publicly, okay? Or if they have some type of shareholders, which means everybody in this room. Not because everybody's public, because everybody has shareholders. Is that fair? There's a problem. This is not something we just found out. Finance people knew about this, but, but we're just doing something about it, which is there's a problem how everybody reports their shares, their earnings, their everything. Is the way you report earnings in one country is pre-taxes and in another country is post-taxes. So the problem here is earnings, margin, revenue gets reported differently in different parts of the world. So there's one that's coming and hitting everybody super strong right now, which is the International Accounting Standards Board which is trying to tell everybody, however you report it for your country, God bless you, do that. But if you want to report earnings on a global status, right, you have to follow these standards. So there you go, one more. But now I just got you again to the heartburn stage, right? You're like, oh my God, I got to do all that. Well, yes, but only on 2% of your data. So the secret here is finding where that is and applying this policies on 2% of your data. So don't go crazy about this, but you have to do it. Because you don't want me to cite, cite as in I could do it right now, but because we're in a public conference, I'd rather not, I'm getting recorded. I like my career as it is. I could cite as many news articles as you read, just like me, of banks and other companies, right? Financial institution companies that got cited and penalized one month ago, six months ago, three, whatever. Countries that lost their whole social security database to a USB stick, okay? And no, these were not lost in the jungle countries. This is actually one of the 10 largest countries in the world, okay? It's pretty bad. So you have to do this, but you have to do this for 2%. And we provide some interesting solutions. Now, well, yeah, there's cost to doing all of this, but we provide some very interesting, by the way, that's not a real application, that's a video, just to show you how it looks. We provide some interesting solutions to this, to the Windows environment. I'm sorry, not for every environment, I understand. But the first one is an app. It's a mobile app that tells you, a, depending on the data type that you select, it tells you which standard and what you have to follow to apply to that standard. So pretty nifty application. And then there's this other application for servers. It's mainly for Windows platform servers that it scrapes the data and it tells you what you have there. So there's some interesting solutions. There's some more soft, sophisticated solutions out there. I urge you to use something. I'm just trying to tell you, don't let that go. So strategy number one, access. Strategy number two, data classification. Are we good? This is useful so far? You, the only thing you got to do is like this or like this. You don't even have to, OK, good. I know it's after lunch, OK? Just simple movements. Now, what about? What about security? Well, it's about policy enforcement, but we've talked about this till we're blue in the face. Let me say a couple of contemptuous things, okay? You're gonna hate me for this, I'm fine. It's not about who has vulnerabilities, it's about who fixes them. 
Stop listening to us and anybody out there. Go to secunia.org. They're the, pretty much the single most independent source of what everybody's doing out there. Read the reports, okay? I just use some of this. But look, some of this stuff is fascinating. And even though we ha we're some of the least, I mean, there's some very interesting, by the way, these are all public reports on the website, okay? There's some pretty interesting places here, and I wanna, I wanna call your attention to this article on CDNet by Kaspersky, nothing to do with us. Recognizing that you have a surface of attack is the first step to avoiding it. Recognize you have it. This is not Apple's surface of attack. If you have iMacs or, or iPads, it's yours. So I'm not saying that it's bad or good. I'm not putting any adjectives in this. I'm just saying don't let it go. Secure it, okay? An open door to the outside is an open door wherever you have it. And like I'm trying to say right now in a very humble and educated tone, don't look ugly for putting this up. I'm just trying to say don't shut yourself down to know there's no security door there that's open. Yes, it is. If you think this is the only article, do a little bit of bing it out. You like how I said that? I was very corporate on that one, you saw? And so the next one is simple. There's a ton of technologies you can use here. Of course, this is a Microsoft talk, so I'm going to put a whole bunch of Microsoft technologies here. There's a lot more out there, but let me show you some of ours, just for the sake of being here. Number one, there's, of course, antiviruses. There's, of course, direct taxes or UAG. There's, there's DAC. There's not only the Windows a, a security and essentials that you can provide there on the, all the anti-malware and antivirus, but there's also a Windows to go solutions that you can do for very interesting environments, kiosk environments, right? Merger type environments. There's also very interesting things like app locker, white listing your applications. There's so many ways. What I'm trying to tell you is don't try to build a house with one tool. Don't VDI it at all, you know? You have a whole bunch of collection of tools that you've already bought. Half of these don't cost. They come with the operating system. Test them out. Build a complete strategy. Use whatever you need to build not only a secure, but a secure, encrypted, and well-managed environment. Hey, I can't do that on some of the devices. We'll talk about that in a minute. Be patient with me. So let's talk about the next one. What about not only having a secure environment, but God forbid, also managing it? And why am I saying this? Because we're seeing a lot of our customers take this route. It's very interesting. So for some of the devices, we're going to do a lot of configuration management. But for some devices, which are more of the BYOD, I'll let you bring whatever you want, we may use something like Intune. So we can manage there just as many. Look, Config Manager can match Android and, and iOS, et cetera, just as Intune can. But Intune is interesting because it, it evaluates, let's say, a little softer, right? It says, look, this, this device here has this surface of attack, and that's it. Or, or you know what, you've got to update the surface. So you can use a configuration or a combination of both tools. You can use one, whichever serves you better. Again, I'm showing you a buffet of technologies, and I'm giving you ideas of what I've seen out there in, in, in real world examples of what people are doing. There's some people that are happy just with Config Manager. There's some people that are mixing it up. Uh, I like the idea of mixing it up for different environments. Now, on the, on the next one, we're going to talk about agility. In agility, there's two ways to look at this. I'm going to lock you down, which is what we've done so far, right? I'm going to stop you from being, from being effective or efficient. And that's what gets us into massive trouble. Fair? That's where people say, I don't want to work with you anymore. I'm going to go find my own and, and spend $500 of my own money, my own hard-earned money to spend something. So it's not about lockdown. It's really about providing agility, but in a controlled manner. And when I say controlled, here it is. There's a whole bunch of applications that you can span across different environments. I'm talking about, let's say, OneNote, or let's talk about Skype, or let's talk about whichever of the logos you see up there. I can use those across devices. And the experience is, if not extremely similar, it's very similar, right? Enough. But what's interesting here is it's not about providing this environments only. It's also about, like I said, in a non-compromising, secure way. Let me give you an example here. So uh, I worked on a project, a, a government project. In, this was in Latin America. It, it was not highly classified, but it was highly uh, uh, regarded because it was one of the main sources of income of this country, right? And what they needed to do is they needed to re-update this infrastructure, and they hired a whole bunch of vendors to construct this, this infrastructure. I'm talking about dikes and dams, OK? But big, big dikes and dams. So the problem was you don't want any of the vendors who are building your dams 
to take their documents with them when they go because they become national, secret national information, whatever you want to call it, right? And some of these guys are, are national, some of these guys are in the country, but some of them come from outside because of the expertise. So what they did is they said, whether they're right or not, this is a real world example. And if you approach me after the session, I may even tell you who it is, okay? And all of you will recognize it in a second. So this guy said, what we're going to do is we're going to tell every single vendor out there that comes and builds, you got to have an active directory with ADFS and right management services for your environment, and we're going to use Office. Uh, I know, full Microsoft, sorry to say, but that's the rules they put. So what did they do is they put literally RMS, right management, on every document. They said, I'm going to give you right now this profile. You're going to be in the group of building, I don't know, part of the dam number one, and that's going to take six months. And while you're in there, you log in, and then you can see all the documents, all the emails, all the communications, the SharePoints, the collaboration, the calendar, everything. And when you're done with your piece, I take you out of that group policy, and guess what? Everything you keep in your laptop and everything, it's encrypted. You can't see it. You can't read your own emails. You can't anything, because I've taken away access to everything. Beautiful solution. Again, I'm not here because of my technology value. I, there's a couple of people here that can go deeper on any of these technology, and I can go deeper on some. I'm here because of the amount of customers that I've worked with and tell you examples. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you real world examples on each one of these of how people have solved them. Okay? So the other thing that you can do here is direct uh, dynamic access control or unified access gateway or whichever gateway that you like. But what do I like about that? That's exactly the access strategy. You see, if you enter the, the portal, if you enter the network, if you enter the service from a phone, then I give you X amount of apps or services. If you enter through a tablet, I give you this others. If you enter through a laptop that doesn't have an antivirus, then I skim back on the applications I allow you to enter. Now you see where I'm going? So the beauty of this is you can truly control the experience, but also the quality without compromising on the security of the environment. Now, if you think that's not it, there's one more thing that has to be it is there's a lot of creative ways that people are doing. There's, there's one thing that I saw in an in a, a insurance company. It's very interesting. They were managing, for some reason, branches, not agents in this case. And what they were doing was they were putting not only config manager, but ops manager and AD on Azure location, so Azure in the cloud. And they were doing the monitoring, the configuration deployment, as well as the uh, Active Directory remote points via Azure. And it was so that they would thin out their presence on their own agencies, on their own uh, remote offices. So what they were looking to do, remember, you have to have a goal, right? This is not good for everybody, but I'm giving you interesting examples. What they were looking to do is to reduce the closet of communication, so the small data center they had on those agencies, and try to put as much services as they could on the cloud. They still need a couple of servers on the agency, but they want to reduce that. Why? Because they can spin it up and spin it down in a second. They can service it, they can manage it, they can replicate it. It's a super simple solution. So interesting idea. I'm not telling you that's the only way to go. I'm, I, again, I'm here to give you different examples, different ideas. So far, so good. Is this useful so far? Should I keep up the examples or less? Wow, the level of excitement, I'm telling you. You guys are killing me. <laughs> I'm going to call my wife and say, honey, I put 500 people to sleep. Cool as hell. She actually knows that. <laughs> it's not even funny. So let's keep going. Let's talk about the next one. A customization of IT, BYOD. Let's look at this for a bit. OK, I told you I was going to talk about other devices in a minute. Let me talk about other devices right now. And let's do this extensively. You see, we're not only going from corporate purchase to any device. Let me tell you what's happening. Is there's four ways to look at this. We came up, this, this guy, Arno Havertfeld from, from Netherlands, he works for us in services. He came up with this framework, and I'm giving him full credit. It's brilliant. It's helped us do a ton of conversations in a way simpler manner than I've ever seen. The way he put all this together, it works like this. The first one is the orange one. It says, here's your own. This is what we've done all the way till the 2000 whatevers. Is hey, I want a computer. And you say, here's your own computer. You say, but I wanted to choose. No, you didn't get it. Here's your own. This is all you get. But I want something I know, and this is what you get. Stay quiet, go home, and say thank you that you got anything. I want you to understand that this is pretty bad. This is what got us into this problem to begin with. 
Now, there is a place for here's your own that is perfectly correct. And this is what you also have to understand. For a medical environment, for a doctor in an examining room, I need here's your own. Would you agree with me? I need a specific PC that if it gets, excuse me for saying this, if it gets splattered with blood, I can clean it and, and sanitize it. And you cannot do that with the device you have in your hands right now. Is that fair? I went through a super extreme example, but I could have said stock trader. Or I could have said highly compliant, whatever you want. I could have said pilot. You see what I'm going? It's just, there's a lot of scenarios that you need, here's your own. And so please don't shy away from this, but this is the one you got to let go. Where most people are going nowadays, and this is almost anybody I've talked to in the last whatever, right, is to choose your own. Choose your own is white listing. It means I'm going to give you a list of 10 devices and you get to choose out of those 10 which one you like. Is that fair? And that works pretty good. Most people are saying that's where I want to go. Now, there's a problem here. There's also the people that say, I want to go into bring your own. In other words, I give you a stipend, I give you some money, you go buy your own device, or you go buy your own device and you bring me the receipt and I give you some money for that, or I give you any money and if you want a device, you go buy it yourself, and I give you some support. And then the last one is, I don't care about you and don't even call me. Okay? So if you got my number, don't call me. Is that good? What is this? This is the guy that's going to come in and paint the room. Hey, the wireless is down. I need a call matching application. Too bad, too sad. Come back tomorrow. That's on your own, literally. Now, why is this important? Because the way I explained it right now is the wrong way to look at it. I'll say it again. It's the wrong way. It's by complete profile. The right way to look at it starts by understanding that Bring Your Own has two types. It has an unmanaged and a managed. Is that fair? And also, and this is the real brilliant part of this idea, that it's not per user, it's per device. Look at this. So I could have that my phone, I don't have my phone with me, I left it, left it up, there, up there. Thank you. You see my, I don't want this phone. This is the wrong brand. What's wrong with you? I'm just kidding. So you see my phone right here. I don't want the company to manage it. Is that fair? I want it to give me certain services on it, but I don't want the company to manage it. So my phone is going to be on your own. Now you see where I'm going? While my tablet, here's your phone back. <laughs> While my tablet is going to be bring your own managed. And my desktop or my laptop is going to be a choose your own. Now you see the brilliancy in this? Why is this brilliant? Because you shouldn't lose fidelity of security or management across any one of these environments. Now you see my point? You should not lose fidelity or quality of management or security across any one of these. But the surface that I'm going to manage across each one of them is dramatically different. The surface that I'm going to manage on the phone, on, on your own, is going to be tiny versus the surface that I'm going to manage on the laptop or desktop, right, is going to be huge, or all of it. Let me go deeper. So. Uh, this is also, actually, I, I really like this slide because it shows you a whole bunch of different uh, dimensions to this problem. The first one is who buys it. Now, let me, let me go into this problem right now because I'll also go into it at the end, but I'd rather uncover it right now. In some countries, example, UK, but many other countries like that, they found two problems. The first problem, this also happened in, in some uh, local and, and state government in uh, the in California, I was going to avoid it, but in California, and it also happened in Germany, okay? So there's three examples. They had to shut down email at 8 p.m. and turn it back on as a service at 6 a.m. And the reason is because they got a couple of lawsuits of people saying, I'm an hourly employee, here is the proof that you sent me an email at 1 a.m., and here is the proof that I replied at 1.30, and therefore you owe me another six hours per day this whole five years. So What's up? So I want you to understand that this gets pretty nasty in a second. The human factor of this is going to smack you in a second. Now, you think that's bad. Let me give you another example. Like I said, in the UK, if you own the device, then the device is yours, but also the data and the applications. So then this guy came up to me from the UK, and he was absolutely right. And he said, but you can change the contract of the employees. 
And I said, yes, that's a great idea. Let me spell that one out. I wasn't making fun of him right now. I'm not making, I, I wasn't making fun of him then. I'm absolutely not making fun of him right now. That's a great idea. Let me show you how you, that's done, because I actually have worked with unions before. First, you go to this, your CEO, and you tell him that he's going to restate the financial a statement of this company because you have to pull back taxes because you're going to have to pay taxes for the people you give them money. Okay? Second, so if, that, if you survive that battle, <laughs> then you go to the unions and now you have to change the labor contract. Now remember, every time you open Pandora's box, not only the minotaur comes out, okay? But a whole bunch of things are up for renegotiation now just because you sat down to renegotiate. So God bless you on that. So there you go. Problem number two, if you pass those two, then you have to talk to the employees and ask each one of them to re-sign their contract. Most people don't even make it through problem point five, let alone three. So what I'm trying to tell you is this employee purchase thing is said really simply in magazines, but in reality, almost nobody has achieved it. Almost nobody has gotten to the point where they re-sign contracts with employees and say, you bring your own, unless, unless it's a model like insurance companies where you have agents where you were never really in charge because they were not your employees. So those, or affiliate type of, of environments, those, but wherever you have a union or you have labor contract laws, you know, I, I don't say this in a bad sense, God bless, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be super hard, super hard. Now, let's talk about the next aspect, which is employee managed. You see, in this environment, you cannot ask the employee to do much because he is the owner of his environment versus you managing it. The other one is rather simple, is I'm going to influence how that device behaves, gets secured, gets managed, and gets blocked versus I have no control over your device. Indifference is not a bad word. It means I just, I, can't, I don't have an opinion. You do whatever you want with it. The next one is simple. The more risk you get, the more freedom you get. The more control you get, the more, the more highly access and secure. But you lose freedom. You see, it's one versus the other. So don't think that you're talking about one person. This is not a profile. Like I said, a profile can have many devices across this. Was this useful? Is that good? By the way, this deck is posted. So if you want to use any of these slides, feel free. You get them at the website. And there's a whole bunch of stuff here that I'm trying to tell you. This would be as if I use profile, which I told you is the wrong way to do it. But as I, if I would use profile, then I could tell you a contractor is, is on your own. A project manager would be bring your own manager, et cetera. You can have different profiles. Just, just to exemplify it. Yeah, there you go. And there's a whole bunch of uh, buffet of technologies you can use to do this. So I'm not going to go crazy into any one of them because you understand them as well as I do. I mean, and if you don't, you get a training and it's, it's not that hard. But understand, whether you use VDI or you use Windows to go, or you use Config Manager, or you use Windows Intune, I'll give you a great example. There was this huge bank in Brazil, uh, 50,000 PCs. Is that huge? Okay, it's not huge. Big bank. You guys are a tough audience, I'm telling you. It's a big bank in Brazil. And their corporate office in Europe bought this other big bank worldwide that happened to have another big bank in Brazil of 45,000 PCs. Would 90,000 PCs, 95,000 PCs be large enough for you? Yes? Now you're satisfied? Okay. Tough audience, man. Tough people, I'm telling you. 95,000 PCs, you think it's simple. So these guys get 95,000 PCs from day one to, to next, and they have to manage them. Even more complicated, and this is where I'm going, forget the word PCs. Forget the word desktops, laptop, devices. It's all wrong. They had 6,000 applications that were redundant. In other words, 12,000 applications out of which 6,000 were exactly like the other 6,000, but somebody else developed them. So what they did is they said, okay, for the desktop environment, for the laptop environment, we need to comply with the applications and we need to do a merger type environment where we do a fade in versus fade out of the application, right? So if you're in bank A and you're in bank B, then I will choose this time for the application, bank B's application. So then I will fade you in and out of that. So I'll give you both environments and then take it off. How do you do that when they were about, I never asked exactly because it was crazy enough, but about a thousand versions of Java running on every PC. You can't have that. It, it, it didn't work. 
So they used AppV. And literally, it wasn't a thousand versions, but what I'm trying to say is they used AppV to literally put all these applications in a safe compound, let me use the wrong word, bubble environment, right? And then what you did is I faded in and out via group policies again. I'm trying to tell you this because that was the most elegant and really, really good use of technology I've seen in a long time. Versus people saying, why don't we do VDI for this? You know how many v images of VDI you would have needed for that? I have nothing against VDI, but again, please. Same thing as let's do remote app. You know how many terminal and, and Citrix and et cetera environments you would have needed to do this? It would have been crazy. It's, it was way easier to say, let's sequence the applications. That way we test them. That way we understand how they're built. And we do three right things at the same time. We catalog our apps. We determine a roadmap for them, right? Merger, which one are we going to keep? What's the fade in, fade out plan for it? You see what I'm doing? It's forcing me to do all the right things because I picked the right technology for that problem. If you come out of here and you say, the guy hates the VDI and he recommends that V, you didn't get me. I said, right tool for the right problem. That's all I said. I actually really, really like VDI. I just don't like the fact that everybody's using it for everything. So the next one is simple. I get excited. I don't know why. I'm sorry. I get excited. I talk louder. <laughs> Let's talk about applications. There's something I want you to understand here. You cannot control if I want to install Angry Birds or not. And you know what? You shouldn't. You shouldn't legally. You shouldn't care that I have it. You shouldn't even mind if I use it on, on corporate time. Because you know what? There is no more corporate time. If you want to be like that, then I don't answer emails until I get to the office. How's that? Or because I went to, to Boston for university, I'll say, how about them apples? How would you like me not responding to emails until a certain time period? Just because you don't let me install something that, what do you care about? Why am I being so harsh on you with this? Because this is a paradigm shift again. You see. You want to install some applications on my environment, right? That's what head tracks is there, or expense approval, PLM, company news, whatever. I just put up some names there. You see, you want to put those on my phone. Now, this is my phone. I bought this phone. I pay the contract. And even if it's your phone, right, and even if you pay for the contract, why do you care if I have a whole bunch of personal things? Simple idea. I came here. I rented a car. Choose a company, Avis, Hertz, Enterprise, whatever. So what? I'm here on company time, but you don't use the application to go and see which. You see my point? It gets crazy. We're not in a world like that anymore, and you have to let it go. You have to stop it, OK? Because this is going to be an on your own device. I'm going, to margin, I'm going to manage certain aspects of it, and certain of them, I don't care. It's your responsibility. Because you know what? There's something we're forgetting. These guys are not users. They are ladies and gentlemen just like you who can contractually agreed and signed a legal document, which is a labor contract, to behave and work for your company to do. You see my point? So where did you make them criminals? <laughs> where did you make them wrong? And why is it your responsibility to restrict them in everything? I keep saying this because some people are saying, let's build our own company store or you know, application store so we restrict. Why? Let the guy be. Give him the application you want, and that's it. Hard enough with the just doing that. You may not agree with me. You don't have to follow my advice. I'm giving you different ideas. My job today is to give you different ideas. Is that fair? Not to change the way you think. It's to make you see other ways of seeing things. That's all. So with that said, let's go to the last one, which is TCO. What I'm going to do right now is exactly what you shouldn't do, OK? I'm admitting it. It's wrong. It's horrible. I did it. I put three reports and I put three sets of data together that don't come from the same sample. So mathematically, this is wrong. Is that enough disclosure so you let me do this? OK, let's just do it. Because you know what? I did it, and I found out some really cool things. <laughs> that's the fun part. Here goes. The first block that you see here on green, that's desktops or laptops, right? And that is for an unmanaged PC. And please stop thinking that's a desktop. It's whatever, right? All the way to a locked and well-managed. Now, let me tell you that in my 12 years analyzing this space, I've never met a locked and well-managed anything. So the best you're going to get is to a moderately managed. Is that fair? OK. 
Then you have hosted desktop, which is either VDI or RDS. And then you have smartphone or tablet. Let's go through this. The first thing I want you to understand is after 12 years of analyzing data center and workload environments, I've learned one single truth. Everything is based on efficiency. You want to be cheaper, be more efficient. You want to be better, be more efficient. You want to provide better quality of services, be more? Thank you, somebody. <laughs> so what is the point here? How do you measure efficiency, right? How do I know I got there? How do I know I'm successful? One way of doing it, not the best, but one standard way of doing it is measuring how many servers can a full-time FTE, right, a full-time equivalent, in other words, an IT person, whether it be from your company or an outsourcing, so I don't care if this is inside, outside, or whatever, can manage. So the first ratio is 137 devices per FTE. Okay? And the next one, all the way to the end, is 221. So look, if you double up efficiency, guess what happens to TCO? The answer is on the board. <laughs> you don't have to look at me. Okay? If you double up efficiency, you cut in half TCO. It's that simple. I've analyzed over 50 documents from anybody, ESG, Forrester, Gardner, Yankee Group, etc. Look it up. It's fantastic. The ratio is almost the same. Efficiency is equal to TCO, almost. So what's interesting here is, is that, OK, if you just manage this pretty well, you get to cut it down by 40%. That's pretty cool. Now, I'm Latin, so 39% means 40, OK? Just in case. Just in case we don't agree. So if I go down to terminal or this is terminal or VDI or RDS, whatever you want to call it, I may get 5% cheaper. So you see, this is interesting because the same study tells you that if you do it on unmanaged PC, so unmanaged and you go VDI, it's 2% cheaper. In other words, taking it to a remote solution makes it more whatever, but it doesn't make it cheaper. Okay, And it also makes it a little bit more frail for the simple reason that now it's working on a centralized SAN that I don't know if you designed for performance. You may have designed for resiliency, which is what? What most of us do. Most of us do a, if path A fails, I do go into path B. But very few of us design, as in I'm going to do eight redundant paths for performance because I'm going to have boot storms and login storms and virus storms and backup storms and deployment of app storms. I mean, what happens if you have 10, who here has over 1,000 PCs? Over 5,000 PCs? 10,000 PCs. Thank you. What happens, I'm going to stay at 5,000 just to be nice, right? What happens when I burst your sand with 5,000 requests to deploy an antivirus at the same time? And this is you threw it out, by the way. You threw it, uh, update the virus uh, signatures. Boom, you kill your, your, your sand and all of a sudden, all your users are out of the network. And it was by your hand, by the way. You see my point? So no, it's not harder. I'm just trying to tell you, be very careful, because it's not cheaper. And it adds a level or degree of complexity to it. Now, for a centralized or non-centralized help desk, static image, it's a beautiful solution. For a specific application that I'm going to remote app or remote VDI into, which is very legacy and I can't upgrade to and I have a path, it's a beautiful solution. So again, I've given you the rights and the wrongs. If you take this to a little bit better enhanced management of the bandwidth, you'll get a little better. And then if you go into the next one, which is, what if I go into a phone? Well, the phone has no corporate security. So if I do that, yes, it becomes a little cheaper. Remember, we're already at minus 8, right? So now it's minus 8 plus, seven, plus uh, minus 17. You, you go a little nine over, and this nine over is going to be but without corporate security. So I lost something by going there. And if I go into a tablet, most tablets in the world, not in the US, but most tablets in the world don't have, or Western Europe, don't have a data plan because data plans are still massively expensive everywhere else. And therefore, and even here, you, not everybody has a data plan on their tablet. So, so the point is, OK, if I do a tablet, yes, but I have no access to data. So what happens if I return and I add access to data in corporate security environment? You just became more expensive than a desktop. So understand, it's not about TCO. There's a full slide to convince you about one thing. Let it go. 
Let TCO go. It's a battle you already lost. It's not going to be cheaper, OK? So if I do this, it's going to be cheaper? No, no. Stop using that argument. I can prove you wrong twice on the week and three times on a Sunday, OK? And, I, and, and if you don't believe me, uh, there's a great storage block there. There's a great smackdown by a company, PQR from the Netherlands. A little bit old, but really, really useful. But if you don't believe me, this is what I'm trying to say. And again, if this is still not good enough for you, uh, this are the articles I read. Go read them yourselves. Is that cool? Now, just in case you said, no, 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 I don't believe this guy. Just take a read, and you see that. If you think that my stuff is not good enough, if Gardner said it must be right, so go for it. OK? That was a joke there. Nobody caught it. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm good with that one. OK, guys. Almost done. I don't know how we're doing with time. Nikki, how are we doing with time? We're doing good? I don't even know. I, I'm, like I said, I'm Latin. What? Eight. Eight minutes? I'm Latin. I have no concept of time. There you go. You're, you'll be out of here mañana, OK? <laughs> Is that good? Where to start? Simple. Workforce segmentation. If you just read one line out of these, workforce segmentation. I'm going to use all the eight minutes, by the way, so please stay in your seats. Now, I promised you I was going to show you how companies are doing this. Let me show it to you. It all starts with classification. So not only workforce, but also which applications and which data are where in this map. High business impact. And you can only have 2% there, by the way. Force yourself to only have 2% there. And then et cetera. Uh, this is the summary of everything I said. It talks about policy legal. It talks about the lawyers. It talks about the accountants. It talks about the legal and the, the taxation system. It talks about the fu functionality. This is just a summary. Let me go into the examples. And by the way, we've built a whole bunch of templates to help you. And you can download this from the, from the internet to help you uh, determine which scenario you should be using for which type of user. But now, outside of all the technology we can, we can help you deploy from us. Let's go into the first example. It is Microsoft IT because it's my oldest example, not because it's the best, not because this is the one I started showing. And then two years later, I got two more examples, which is what I'm going to show you in a second. And then after that, I got six more examples. OK? Sadly, not everybody said I can show their examples here in the event. But what I'm trying to tell you is I have up to about nine to 10 examples of people that I've shown that have done something very similar to this. And it's incredibly useful. Let me show you how this is. I, get, I have to read this very slowly for you. You understand who Microsoft IT is. This is the IT organization of inside of Microsoft. It takes care of some crazy people like the guy who builds Active Directory. Okay? You don't have none of that in your network, trust me. Okay? <laughs> and then it takes care of a, a whole bunch of interesting people like Microsoft Research, and then the Yahoo's like me who are corporate users. But this is what they do. Now, don't read it. Let me read it for you. If I start here, you, you see on the top all the way to the left, MSIT standard. If you buy an MSIT standard machine, then you get everything. You see you get help desk, hardware support, software support, line of business application, patching, uh, driver support for, the, for Microsoft IT images. You get encryption on the hard drive, uh, IPv6, direct access, VPN with smart card if you want it. Wi-Fi exchange, corporate access to applications, and unified communications. Cool? If you buy also a domain joint PC with TPM, which is not an MSIT standard, you get best effort on hardware. Let me explain what that is. If I fly with my Lenovo to Germany tomorrow and I forget my power supply, they will have one there that I can just grab and use. But if I go with my standard or non-standard laptop that I bought, they're not going to have a power supply for me. OK? Now, if I go there with my own consumer PC that I bought that doesn't have a TPM chip, not only that, I will not have access to some applications because my hard drive is not encrypted. Now you see the effect of this? And if I go there with a PC that's not nothing, not, not even domain join, it's going to be a whole bunch of maybes and no's. An MS phone, again, I only give you a couple of access to applications email and calendar. And if you give me any other phone, like an iPhone and an Android, and yes, we have people like that. And we develop for almost every platform. So yes, we have for. So what happens there? I give you email and calendaring. Why? Because I don't know if you want anything else. So please think of your own environments. I don't know if I said anything aggressive there. Because initially, I don't know if I wanted anything else. You see my point? Maybe I just wanted email, calendaring, and some internet access, and that's it. 
Okay, now you said that was Microsoft. Let me show you some others. The other one is this one, which is an example of somebody who did exactly the same thing, but he did it in phases. This is a real slide, completely sanitized, I hope, that I didn't forget anything, from a customer that said, I'm building exactly the same thing for my end users, but I'm doing it in phases. And as you can see, they started in Q1 of 2013. They're planning to end by 2014. And you can see there that they're saying for devices, for applications, for settings, and for docs, what they're going to do in version 1.0 all the way to 3.0. Why am I not spending a ton of time on this uh, slide? Because it's very self-evident. So let me spend some time on, this, on the next one, which is another set of people who said exactly the same thing, but they said it per roles. Uh, I'm going to spend very little time on this because I have the same exact information in a graphical way that's easier to consume, but I'll just read this very fast. You see, you have your profiles. They said executives, corporate, commercial, R&D, contractors, and manufacturing. And they said, for contractors, I'm going to give you a Windows to go USB stick, and that's my application. You can consume anything from me while you're in that environment, but I'm not going to, and you can bring whatever you want, right? But you cannot use your own. So you can boot into my Windows to go and use that. So that was a brilliant way to solve this, right? Because it's very easy to support. That's why I say brilliant. So I'm giving you different ideas, I hope, here. Another very interesting thing that they're doing here is, as you can see, they have iOS, they have RT, they have 7 and 8. I mean, they have Mac. I mean, they have everything. I, I want you to see I'm not being Microsoft Kool-Aid-ish. This is everything out there into the sun, OK? And this is how it looks if you want to consume it in a very <laughs> easy format. I hope you think this is pretty cool, because this is literally everything I told you in a real deployment. And by the way, this guy's already finished. This is deployed. And we have another about nine, nine examples of people who are completely deployed with this type of examples. The important thing that I want you to get out of here is, can I move away from this slide? You want to read a little more? Move away? Okay. So the important thing that I want you to get out of this session is that it's all about this. Is that fair? Is that fair? It's all about saying yes. If you don't start saying yes, there, I'm not saying this in a bad way, but they will find somebody that says yes, OK? Because they're tired. Everybody out there is tired of us saying no. Is that fair also or not? So we have to learn how to say yes responsibly, correctly. And I just showed you a matrix of how to do that. You say, look, man, if you consume A from B, this is the level of service you get from me. If you come in with C, this is the level of service you get from me. I don't know anybody who wouldn't find that correct. I've been talking, I'm not kidding you, to about 100 something customers about this in the last two years. I haven't heard anybody say, no, that's not, that's not useful for me. In the sense of, no, I couldn't talk to my users, or I talked to business environments, and they said, yeah, I would love to have that. I'm bringing my own, but I'm, uh, it's up to my consequences. So just to finish up, there's a whole bunch of resources that we can give you. Some of this is old. Some of this is updated. I'm sorry for the old stuff. Some of the seven stuff is there. but. There's a whole bunch of good stuff up there. Great video. And we want your feedback. Let me go to the most beautiful slide of any Microsoft presentation. You ready? One, two, three, four. There you go. Isn't that cool? Guys, let me just, let me just ask you one big favor, OK? Whatever you do on this space, stop trying to build the house with one tool. I know I use VDI as the example, but I could have used anything. You know, update to 8, <laughs> going to iOS. It, don't pick one tool to solve this. You're not going to solve it. Number two, build a matrix, build an SLA, and try to, you know, drink this big gulp in chunks. You're not going to be able to boil the ocean. It doesn't work. You're going to raise the ocean two degrees and stop. Okay? Grab a small piece, be successful, continue. Thank you so much for coming to the conference. Enjoy it. <laughs>